here with us today. All right. The only way to describe our next guest mm -hmm. is super. A superstar, a super dancer, a superhero, and also a mm -hmm. massive fan of the Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. All right, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and welcome on stage Ritik Roshan. Thank so, you. So glad to have you with us. Now, before we move forward, I have to ask you the question to both of you. What about the Lord of the Rings, the Rings of Power, are you most excited about? Tamana, you want to take a crack at it? Good afternoon, everyone. Well, definitely Lord of the Rings, the cinematic appeal that it has, it's just one of a kind. Yeah. I still go back to it over and over again and it still seems as fresh. I mean, it is visual storytelling at its best. So, be it the books or any of the screen adaptations that have been made, I feel like um, they're so engrossing and they just captivate you, take you into another world. And I feel like that quality is something I find most enchanting. Um, yeah, now that we've seen the teaser, the trailer, the preview, <laughs> I really can't wait. I think it is stunning. I, as an audience, I'm just waiting and I think it's going to be amazing. Awesome. Ritik, what excites you the most? Oh, I think the trailer speaks for itself. Yeah. This is, uh, this is the kind of stuff that I aspire for. You know, it just, it does something to my cells. It's a uh, visual extravaganza meeting great content. You know, mm. it's just... And uh, I'm just excited and thrilled that I'm going to be able to watch The Middle Ages on Prime Video on 2nd September. I also have a, a little tale to tell, okay. if, I, if I may. Please. There's a little connection between me and the Lord of the Rings that I don't think anybody knows. And uh, I recall this this, this morning. Uh, so, one random day back in 2004, my dad put on the Lord of the Rings part one, saw the film, couldn't stop, saw part two, couldn't stop, saw part three. And then he gave me a call and he was just talking about the way they've used this one great incredible idea and then progressed and had this progression which was so incredible and why can't we do that so i said okay yeah what what are you talking about and he said why can't we take koi milgaya which is one of our previous films and have a progression and build on that and that was the birth of krish wow. so if there was no lord of the rings there'd be no krish <laughs> so i'm going to take this opportunity to give my little thanks to the lord of the rings <laughs> for making krish happen <laughs> awesome well thank you tamanna thank you to take uh, it's been an absolute labor of love for us bringing this series to you and we hope fans everywhere not only enjoy it but also see the sincerity that we have attempted with uh, in bringing Tolkien's work to life, right? And I thank you once again. Uh, I will now leave you to fans of The Lord of the Rings to bring on the stage the amazing team behind the series, all yours now. All right, thank you. Thank Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause for Sushant Sriram. This, come on, we can do better. Yeah. This is truly an exciting moment for me and us, the fans of the fantasy franchise right now. And I am not going to take any more time, leave you into the capable hands of Hrithik and Tamanna. Over to you guys. Thank you, Xerxes. Thank you very much. It's indeed a matter of great honor and privilege to be interacting with the magnificent team behind this epic series. And I think the time has come. So ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for our incredible showrunner, Mr. J.D. Payne. Uh, yeah. Welcome. Oh. Okay. Tamara, thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. Welcome to being here. We're so excited and delighted 
<laughs> that you are here. Success now. <laughs> That's how it works. <laughs> well, this is such an incredible, aspiring piece of work. I just saw the trailer and I'm completely blown. Absolutely incredible. Thank you, thank you. Tell me, I, I was just... Uh, what was your experience of encountering Tolkien's work? And what does Tolkien mean to you? Um, so I came to Tolkien by way of the Peter Jackson films. I uh, saw them first when I was in my early 20s. And um, they were one of the few films that came out when I was an adult that got into my heart the way that films used to when I was a kid. Uh, and from there I did the deep dive and read all the books and, and yeah. you know, got super into it. And now they've woven themselves into the fabric of my life. Uh, very rare does a day go by that I don't reference something happening in my life by way of Lord of the Rings, saying I feel like Frodo carrying the ring today <laughs> or um, you know, uh, when weddings or funerals come along, Tolkien quotes always make their way into my toasts or eulogies. So Tolkien is just part of my soul. I can see, I can see the passion and it shows in your work. And you have your incredible cast here with you. Oh, they're absolutely amazing. Yeah, I'm really incredible. excited for you to meet them. I've always believed that, you know, casting has, uh, is one of the most difficult aspects of filmmaking. How was this process for you? How, how difficult was it for you? Well, so we knew we had to get this right. The story we're telling is an amazing story. It's Tolkien's untold story of the Second Age. So we're telling the story of, of the forging of the Rings of Power, uh, the rise of the Dark Lord Sauron, uh, the fall of Numenor, and finally the last alliance of Elves and Men. And so to be able to bring that really to life, we knew we needed a cast that was really special. And so we had really two criteria for our cast. And one, they had to be amazing performers, but two, they had to have Middle Earth in them. Um, you had to look in their eyes and feel like they could have stepped out of a magical portal and been from Middle Earth transported to our world. Um, and right. so we auditioned hundreds and hundreds of people for every single role and found uh, 22 needles in 22 haystacks. <laughs> That's incredible. How long was the process? Um, for, for, uh, quite a long time. I mean, it, it took a bit, basically a year to find you know, wow. our entire cast. That's incredible. Absolutely incredible. And is this the first time that you're working with Amazon Studios? Uh, yes. What yeah, was that, that experience like? Uh, amazing. Um, so Amazon decided that they, they wanted to put on um, this uh, enormous adaptation of Tolkien and they had a, a huge ambition and um, our, our, our ambition matched their appetite for what they wanted to do. They went out and got the rights to it and then mm. they basically said it's a wide open field and so they, they opened it up to Hollywood to say like who has an idea for how they'd like to take this material and tell a story and my partner and I came in and, and pitched a, a, a way in and, and they got excited about it and since then they have uh, been wow. incredibly supportive. They've given every resource necessary to realize Tolkien's imagination on the grandest scale possible. Wow, that's incredible. They're amazing. It's been, <laughs> I, we've been very, 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 very fortunate. I'm so glad you had a great experience. I mean, it was, it was a fantastic experience. Like, you know, and I've worked with every studio in town in Hollywood, and Amazon has been amazingly supportive. I have one last question. How many days did it take you to shoot? Oh gosh, um, <laughs> it was, it was, well, you know, so we had COVID that was in the middle of it. So oh, we, we, we yeah. shot uh, 20 some odd days and then COVID uh, interrupted us and we were on a hiatus for about six months. And then, so, I mean, uh, it depends on how you count first unit days, second unit days, stunt days, VFX days, but something like 300-ish. Count them know, all, sort of, yeah, 300-ish, you know, yeah. And so a, a, a gargantuan schedule. Okay. I'd say that's inspiring. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, can you imagine my state as to how badly I'm fangirling right now? Like... <laughs> J.D. Payne, Hrithik Roshan. <laughs> J.D. Payne, welcome to India. How has it been for you? I really want to know. Oh, it's been fantastic. It's been really fantastic. Um, I've dreamed of coming to India my entire life. I, I've um, admired this entire uh, country from afar and uh, had Indian friends since I was a, a young boy. My first Indian friend was Aviv Patia um, that I used to play uh, soccer and football with when we were 10 years old and, and uh, you know, then I've had Indian friends ever since and, and um, so it's beautiful to, to finally come to, the, to this, this wonderful, wonderful place. I'm so glad you feel that way. Now I'm, I'm going to dare and ask you this question. You are an epic storyteller. Star Trek, guys, there's <laughs> nobody who does, hasn't seen it. It's not possible. So. I mean, this is something that's a familiar ground for you in terms of scale and, you know, storytelling. But was it daunting for you to attempt material that has fan following, which is so widespread and for them, this material is so sacred. Also, was it any kind of pressure while you were attempting Tolkien's work? Well, I mean, the biggest pressure was the pressure that Patrick and I put on ourselves, um, simply because they're 
Um, there's such a need for what Middle Earth can bring to our world. Um, there's a real darkness in our world right now. Um, there's a lot of people who are in a lot of pain. Um, political darkness, uh, economic darkness, social darkness, just a lot of challenges. And Middle Earth speaks to people in their soul. Um, it's one of the reasons why Tolkien's work has been, I mean, next to like the Bible, the Quran, and certain writings of Mao Zedong, Tolkien has been the most selling work of all, of all time. And I think that's because no matter what country people come from, no matter what background they have, um, when people find Tolkien, it, it goes past all of those other things and finds them in their heart and in their soul. And so we felt like we needed to capture that special feeling of Tolkien. Because really, the Second Age, the story I mentioned a moment ago, Tolkien sketched it out, but he didn't do it in a ton of detail in, in a lot of parts. So there was a lot of things where we had to very carefully excavate what he had shown us, but then also to um, continue to uh, connect the dots and, and fill some, some of the gaps in where necessary. So we tried to do that in as Tolkienian a way as possible um, to be able to bring that light and that feeling of Middle Earth. And I could say that one of my best moments so far was we, we um, showed some Tolkien super fans about 20 minutes of the show, and we were sort of flies on the wall sitting in the back of the auditorium, and I heard, uh, and uh, someone asked, well, what did you guys think of it? And one of them said, you know, it just feels like Middle Earth. And I spontaneously broke into tears. <laughs> and I was like, that's all I wanted to accomplish. <laughs> That is amazing. Well, हम पहली बार कर रहे हैं एक ताली तो मार लो हमारे लिए. Thank you guys. <laughs> yeah, I think it's been it's been so nice, you know, knowing these things from you. But I really want to meet, meet the, the cast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cast. totally excited to bring them out. Yeah, I'm happy to introduce them. Shall we? Uh, yeah, um, guys, you want to start walking on out, and I'll, I'll give introductions as you do. I think first I see I'm I see stand up. do I see Naz Nazanin Bonyadi I think is our first one back there. So we have Nazanin Bonyadi who plays Bronwyn. Welcome. Woo! We have we have Maxim Baldry who plays Isildur. We have Markella Cavanaugh. Markel Cavanaugh, who plays Eleanor Nori Brandyfoot. We have Lloyd Owen, who plays Elendil. We have Sarah Zagobani, who plays Marigold Brandyfoot. Then we have Charlie Edwards, who plays Kella Brimbor. Megan Richards, who plays Poppy. Let's make sure there's enough stage. Poppy Proud Fellow, I should say. <laughs> and we have Tyro Muhafadin, who plays Theo. <laughs> and we have Emma Horvath, who plays Earian. <laughs> and Rob Aramayo who plays Elrond Peredale. And I think that's it. Everyone, one more welcome for our entire Lord of the Rings cast. Welcome to India, guys. Thank you. Thank it's you. amazing Thank you. to have you guys here. And all the best. Good luck for this. It looks incredible. Robert, I have a question for you. You're playing one of the most famous Elven characters, Elrond. What does Elrond mean to you? And uh, how do we meet Elrond in the Middle Age in, in these series? Yeah, well, it's the Second Age, so he's um, much younger than the trilogy or anything mm. like that. Um, he's half elven, which is a sort of unique thing in the elven world. Um, he's young, he's ambitious, uh, he's serving his king, um, and yeah, curious about different cultures and stuff. Was it fun? Very fun. Very <laughs> was fun. it hard? Very hard, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Then it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> Nazanin, can I ask you a question? Yes, please. So you play Bronwyn of, South, of the Southlands? Yes. 
and she's a healer. So what we've seen in the trailer is she's extremely powerful, yet she's nurturing. So from where did you draw the strength to play a character this magnanimous? Thank you for the question. It's so good to be back in India. Uh, and thank you for your warm welcome and hospitality. Um, I love playing Bronwyn because she is so multifaceted. She's, as you said, a healer, um, a single mother to a rebellious teenage son played by Tyro, wow. in a forbidden romance with an elf, Arondir, who is tasked with watching over the Southlanders. I play a Southlander who, who historically her ancestors chose the wrong side, they chose evil over good, and she's trying very hard to redeem them. What I love about her is that she is uh, very resilient and strong, as you said, um, as well as nurturing. And I was, a, I was gonna be a doctor before I ac started acting. I have a degree in biology, so that side of her, the healing side, resonates with me. But also, her determination to redeem her people and to liberate them from the forces of, of evil of their past, the shackles of their past really resonates with me as an activist because um, I'm a long time activist for my homeland, Iran, human rights activist. And women in Iran and in many places in the world are at the forefront of the move towards democracy, freedom, and human rights. And so that's where I drew inspiration. That's amazing. That's amazing. So. And may I just say, I've, I have seen your work and, and I think you're an incredible actor. And thank you for all the, the wonderful things that you're doing and you're standing for. Thank you very much. Thank you. Excellent. Tyro, my Hello. man. How's it going? <laughs> you play Theo, right? Yes. And you're the youngest of them all. Looks like it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like? What's the experience, man? Well, I mean, I think this is kind of big for everyone because it's not every day you get to work on The Lord of the Rings, which is huge. Um, but, you know, thank you to JD for entrusting me with, with the role, given my inexperience, I guess you could say. But, um, no, I think the whole cast has been really, really, really supportive and, you know, have really taken me under their wing, especially Nas. Um, you know, I was very, very nervous and anxious. I, I came from working on sets with, like, five people as the crew to hundreds. Um, and, you know, it was very, very overwhelming, but, you know, with J.A. and, you know, Wayne and Charlotte and Nas, Ismael, Ian, everyone that I worked with um, just made me feel so comfortable and helped me do my job, which is, which is ultimately the, the most important thing. And, yeah, I went from Perth to Mumbai in front of all of these beautiful people and I'm here and, yeah, how's it going, everyone? <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I'm truly, truly blessed. That's amazing, man. You almost look in character. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I like it. I like the style. Thank you. <laughs> it's a Middle Earth orange. <laughs> it's Middle Earth orange. And uh, Charles. Yes. Hi. Yes, hi. Senior work. Big fan. Thank you very much. Um, everyone knows uh, the famous Elvin characters of Galadriel and Elrond, but I believe there is no story without you. Do you agree? <laughs> I'd have to agree with that, yes. <laughs> Good answer. Although, no, there are other, obviously there are many, many other stories and themes in Tolkien and in our, in our show, but ultimately the story of the Rings of Power is the one that brings them all uh, to a head. But that's what's so interesting about Tolkien. For such a major storyline, he gives Celebrimbor a very little uh, page space. He's, uh, he's mentioned briefly, and those contradict each other, those mentions. So what we are, Hunt... Uh, the showrunners, myself, the heads of the department, the directors and the writers, is to find uh, the hooks that Tolkien has given us, mm. um, hang a few things on there, see how that goes, and then rummage around in the wardrobe a little more, see what else one can find in there, a few more hooks, a few more bits and pieces, hang it all up and, and see how it looks. And um, it's also the first time that Keller Brimble has been featured <coughs> in a live action uh, adaptation of Tolkien's stories, so I'm very much looking forward to seeing what you all think about him. Amazing. <laughs> Lloyd, I'd really like to ask you, you're playing Elendil. I am. The father to um, Isildur. Isildur, yeah. Isildur is a very important boy, yeah. character. 
but I just didn't want to do debauchery of the language. So I was like, okay, let me not get Isildur wrong, because everyone out there will want to come after me then. So, um, so definitely, you're playing the father to Isildur and Aryan, who's played by Maxim and Emma. So, um, can you tell us what do we expect out of the series? And um, and what is this world? And what what is it? What is it? What, what's, been, what's been the experience for you uh, being a part of this? Thank you for the question. First of all, it's really, really good to be back in India too, like Nas. Uh, I've had a beautiful experience working here in the past, so very happy to be back. Um, yes, Elendil, who is, uh, as we see him at the beginning of the, the series, he's a sea captain, very capable man, but he's been, he's been widowed and he's trying to deal with his grieving adult children, two of whom are present here in, in, in Maxim and Emma as you say. Um, and he's a very, he's a very well-known character in The Legendary Man. Many fans of the movies would have seen, seen him in brief, but if you read the books, he's referred back to a lot. And he's a sort of hero archetype. Um, and he's very dear to a lot, of the, a lot of the fans' hearts for that reason, because of his ultimate self-sacrifice at the end during the, the Alliance of Elves and Men, where he dies in the act of trying to defeat Sauron. So, but again, rather like Charles was saying about Celebrimbor, um, there are only these, these sort of limited signposts along the way that Tolkien gives us. To, so uh, there's this great sort of responsibility and privilege and excitement to be able to fill out those, those gaps. And where, where we see him at the very beginning is, is, is this one... Tolkien's Atlantis uh, is Numenor, the island of Numenor, where, we, where, where Elendil comes from. Um, and, and at this point in the story... We, Numenor is at its absolute peak, but it's right on the precipice between a, a sort of more nationalist uh, side of the island which, which feels they need an independence from the elves and a more faithful side. And, and Elendil is very much torn between those two parts of society, between his head and his heart. His head is rational, pragmatic, trying to keep his family safe, and his heart is drawn towards the faithful. And something of the schism in, in that society is also reflected deep in the family within his children. So that there's a lot for him to deal with at the beginning. And uh, I'm very excited to, to chart this man to, uh, hmm. through, through that journey. So, um, yeah, I'm very, very privileged and very excited to be here. As an actor being on, on the set, uh, the adaptation of Numenor, nobody's ever seen this world. So how is it to be on a set which so many people have imagined? but never really seen. You were actually there, so what was the experience like? It was genuinely extraordinary in the sense that um, in, in the modern world we expect everything to be CGI now, but, but, but we built Numenor, we built the capital city of Numenor and it took six months to build and I remember the first day walking onto that set was quite an extraordinary experience. I was with JD and he, he showed me around and um, just the attention to detail that the the, the amount of skill uh, and brilliance in every department on this job and, and ultimately the dedication and love that you feel. So they built the city from the ground up and you can feel the history and how, how architecture changed over centuries, where loyalties lie um, and, and the changing face of, of the landscape uh, around it. Because that was also, I also, I think my second day on set was um, filming a sequence on the beach with Galadriel as we're, as we're riding our horses. Uh, and again was, was with JD and we realized that this is the first time that we'd seen the geography of Numenor, the physical geography of Numenor. And that was another beautiful moment to think, wow, I've actually, I'm actually the first person to be part of that. So that was, that was super exciting. And there was, there's one member of our security team from Amazon who walked us back when we were in Comic-Con, walked us back to the hotel. And she said, I've been, t I've been told not to talk to the actors and geek out about Lord of the Rings. I was like, come on, geek out, geek out. Let's see what you, let's see what you got. But she'd said her, both her parents were fans of Lord of the Rings. She'd read it. She'd read The Silmarillion. She'd watched the movies. And she said, and when she saw Numenor on screen for the first time, she'd seen the first three episodes, she said she just burst into tears. And I, t I thought that was a really, really good sign that oftentimes when we read the books, our imagination is really powerful, but somehow this exceeded her expectations, or should I say enhanced her expectations of what Numenor, Numenor was. So I was, I was really, really pleased about that. That's really amazing. That's All really I'm thinking is I wish I had that voice. <laughs> I know, it's a great voice, isn't it? <laughs> it is. <laughs> it's a little deeper after the yeah, airplane flight. You can flight. use we it. Well. Took, you know how to use uh, it. <laughs> Lloyd, the thing is, most of the times I sound like you. 
So I have a hard time sounding like me. Maxim, Isildur, huh? Yes. How does it feel? Because this is this is a character that everyone is waiting to watch, and um, it has fans all over the world. So, where does this arrive in the series? Um, well, he's a sailor on the kind of cusp of adulthood when we first meet him, and there's an emptiness and a void in him. Uh, and I guess he's not, he doesn't really want to fit in to societal expectations of him. He doesn't want to really be like his father in a way, but then there's a pressure to also... Children. <laughs> uh, so you kind of meet him deliberating and yearning for something else that potentially is um, not in Numenor, not on the island. Nice. <laughs> Emma, I have a question to ask you. Do you want to say something, Riti? Go on, go on. Go on. <laughs> Are you sure you don't want to say anything? Absolutely sure. Just checking. I was just thinking he could uh, do well in Hindi films. Actually, he does have yeah. a very Indian face. Yeah. I don't know if it's... I'll take yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> would, you, would you do a film in which you'd cast the three of us? The three of us? Yeah, why not? Yeah, well, if you write it. <laughs> Anyone interested? Make us Mr. out Payne. there, in case anyone's listening to us. Between seasons, see no evil, hear no evil. <laughs> <laughs> Emma, your character. Hi. How is Mumbai treating you? Please it's, tell me. It's awesome. It's I'm awesome. so happy to be here. I've never even been to Asia. So this is, I mean, wow. continental and country-wise. I'm like, wow. Totally new. And when did you come in, if I may ask? Sorry? When did you reach her, if I may ask? Uh, 3 a.m. this morning. <laughs> <laughs> and she looks so stunning. <laughs> guys, All of big you guys. round of That's applause incredible. for just that absolute beauty. Emma, you're playing Aryan. Yes. And that's a beautiful name. Yeah, I, I love it. Do you love it? Yeah, yeah I think it's, I, it's, it sounds very magical. Mm -hmm. um, it, means, it means sea maiden. Sea maiden. No. Oh, that's beautiful. I was about to ask you, what does it mean? About okay. the name, yeah? <laughs> no, no, good, good, good. That's, uh, <laughs> but does this have any significance with, um, you know, is it relevant in any way to the islands of Numenor or is, is there any significance as to how we, that's a part of how you created the character? Yes, um, Numenor is a very nautical society and so it's very apt that she's named after the sea. Um, Isildur means servant of the moon and Anarion, the middle child, uh, is a reference to the sun. Uh, so her siblings their names reference sort of celestial heavenly bodies and her name is quite grounded um, which is very apt because uh, the schism that Lloyd was mentioning that's occurring on the island is also s starting to shake, take shape within the family. Um, she's immensely proud of her people and the island and the beauty that they've created um, and the society that they've created and she's quite frustrated with both of her brothers who have these sort of romantic ideas of the past and spend a lot of time sort of looking up and she's very much looking down at the beauty that her people have created so um yeah i think her name is is very appropriate it's a beautiful Same name indeed yeah. and markella hi again hello <laughs> you play uh nori a half foot yes. Am I saying that right? Harfoot. Yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't working before. Um, yes, I do. I play a half foot. Half foot. What, what is a half foot? A half foot, they are, they're a migratory group. They're a community. And um, they have big feet and ears. And they have a lot of heart and joy um, and stick together in the face of adversity. And they just... They're constantly looking over their shoulders, but they, they're optimists as well, despite having to be survivors. Is there anything specific that makes them special to you? I think that they don't see their vulnerability as a weakness. I think that wow. they, they're able to... I like that. ...to recognize how it can be a strength, and actually by opening up to, peop to you know, the rest of the community and to their loved ones, right. they can hopefully find a better life for themselves and, and find themselves a home. Right. And Megan, Megan, you... Uh, hi, Megan. Uh, hello. <laughs> <Hey>. uh, <laughs> you play Poppy, who is uh, best friends with Nori. Yes, I do. Right. And what can we expect out of this friendship? Um, Poppy and Nori's friendship um, 
they are very much the yin to each other's yang. Um, Poppy is sort of the more cautious out of the two of them, and I think it's safe to say Nori is the more adventurous of the two of them. Yes. So that already tells you quite a lot. <laughs> um, but Poppy sticks by Nori's side throughout the series, um, and that is sort of like an ongoing theme, I think. Um, but she does that because she finds it important. She has such a love and loyalty for her friend. Um, and she finds it, you know, Markel has already mentioned the community, and in the community they have a very specific set of rules. Mm. Um, and they're very important in order to make sure, in order to ensure everybody's safety. And Poppy really believes in those. Um, and so the reason that she follows Nori is, to, is for protection. She believes that that's the best way to protect everybody, community included. So they get up to a lot of adventure um, and a lot of mischief. Did you <laughs> and all a lot of fun. Sorry. Did y'all know each other before uh, the, f uh, the No, we didn't. we didn't. We didn't. We met on the day. On the yeah. day. Maybe like a couple of weeks before yeah. we started filming. Uh, but it was, it was really nice because we got to sort of hang out and call it work. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> yeah, it was really nice. That's nice. They're like sisters, these two. It's amazing. <laughs> and Sarah, Sarah, you, uh, you have been a fan of the books and the films, and now you get to play the matriarch of the Brandyfoot Harfoot family. I do, yes. Wow, what, uh, what did, uh, was that like for you? Well, it's amazing. I just suddenly realized there's three parents here with naughty children, actually. That's a bit of a theme <laughs> of today. I haven't actually done a, um, uh, interviews with the, with the other parents here, so it's quite funny. Um, <laughs> Um, as a fan of fantasy, it was obviously incredible, but I, I don't think you needed to be a fan of fantasy to uh, realise that this is an absolute dream job. I mean, uh, first of all, this incredible cast that I get to work with and that I get to now travel around the world with and come to an amazing country like India, where I haven't been before, um, <laughs> is just a joy. So, uh, lover of fantasy or not, it, it was it's been one of the best jobs of my career. Um, playing Marigold is also an absolute honour. Um, thank you to JD and Patrick. Being a, a parent to this um, beautiful actress here, Michaela Kavanagh, and a surrogate mum to Megan Richards, and having so much fun on set. Um, the Harfoots, as, as Michaela was saying, you know, they, they've been through a lot, but they have a lot of joy and laughter and love, and that's what it was like being on set. We, we just had such an incredible time working together. Um, and I'm still, I'm quite stunned that I'm sitting here <laughs> with them all now, able to talk about it to the world. It's, it's just such a privilege. Well, I have to say, the joy and the love, it shows. It's showing on all your faces. This is going to be a great one, guys. JD, to round this off, do you have anything that you want to tell our lovely audiences? And also, do my elfish ears make a cut? <laughs> like to They're wonderful. I mean, you would actually have to, have to cut them a little bit to help them make the cut, but they... they uh... <laughs> Okay. But they're close. They're close. Okay, good. Let's talk. Have your people call my people. <laughs> that sounds like a plan. Um, yes. Well, I just, I just wanted to reiterate what a special group of people you have in front of you right now. It's been my great joy to work with them each over the course of several years now. And, and I look at them each and, and have a dozen stories that pop into my mind for every single one of the people here. And um, you're, you're just getting a small taste of it now. But each of them in some moment of the season will take your breath away. Um, they truly have some, that special something that is, is part of Middle Earth that is inside of them that they've managed to capture with these characters um, and the world is going to discover it very soon. And also, a uh, few, few last things I'd, I'd love to say is that um, I take it here, many people are, are fans of, of, of Tolkien, but if you haven't ever experienced Tolkien before, uh, if you've never even worn a ring before um, and have no idea, what, or if you wandered off the street and, or if this is reaching someone who, who hasn't experienced Middle Earth, um, you don't need to know anything about uh, Tolkien to uh, enjoy this show. You can walk in off the street having never seen any of the movies, having never, never read any of the books, um, and the show will sweep you away and, and tell you all that you need to know about Middle Earth and then hopefully point you back to the books because they're really worth doing the deep, deep dive on. They're, they're books that really stay with you and get inside of you in, in a very unique and special way. Um, and uh, this is a time uh, in, in the world when, when we need a little bit of Tolkien and we all need a little bit of Middle Earth. So we hope that you're able to in, enjoy the show and uh, feel that special thing that each of these people has been such a, a, a foundational part of bringing to life these years. Um, so, so thank you very much for having us here. We really appreciate it. It's amazing. I have to say this to JD, to the entire cast and crew, that this is something that I personally believed in, that cinema, in any language, anywhere in the world, 
the moment it is based on human emotions, basic human emotions, um, it always cuts through all. There's, there's no language needed, there's no country needed and I feel like uh, that faith that I have uh, in the cinema that I want to do has been reaffirmed by Rings of Power. So thank you, thank you all for coming here and being a part of this press conference. We are so excited for this and we can't wait to see the series. Thank you so much, Tamana, and thank you, Riddick. Thank you, thank thank you, thank you, thank you very thank much. You. Wasn't that a wonderful, <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to pull a ring of power on you, but yeah, wasn't that a wonderful moment for all us fans of the Lord of the Rings. Let's give them a huge round of applause for Ritik, Tamanna and the wonderful cast and crew of Lord of the Rings, the, the Rings of Power. It's a perfect opportunity for a photo op at this point, yeah? Yeah, let's have Gaurav, Albert and Sushant back on stage for a wonderful photo op with the